Um, just to tell you a little bit about our branch of, LA, our of IDA, we're part of the International Dyslexia Association. We're one of, I think there's 56 branches around the country and the world. And um, the national organization has a very robust website. I encourage you to go online and see the videos and all the different things that are there for great parent training. Our local branch, we're really into training of teachers in structured literacy. Um, we just gave out grants just a couple nights ago to five schools and districts here in the Los Angeles area for promoting teacher training and programs for students. But right now, if you're a teacher, go on our website and take a look at the um, training opportunities available this summer because we're still offering scholarships for those up to half off. So look online and um, there's a scholarship deadline. So look at that, but it's a great way to get training at a really good price. And it's training that really makes a difference. It's the best training I ever took as an educational therapist to help my students. So it's powerful and it makes a huge difference. So let's get into our time with Natalie today. Let me introduce her to you. You can see her on the top, well on my top of my screen. I don't know where she is in here, but she's got Nice green shirt on, you can see your name there. Um, Natalie is an educational writer and she's author of The Knowledge Gap. How many people have read that? Or you've got it on your book stand ready to go. Um, and she's also the co-author with Judith Hawkman of The Writing Revolution. A lot of people, I've been hearing a lot of parents talking about it. I've got it sitting here get, getting ready to crack open. She's a senior contributor at Forbes. Her articles and essays on education and other topics have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic and other publication. She's spoken about, about education on a wide variety of groups and appearing on a number of TV and radio shows, including Good Morning Joe, or Morning Joe, NPR's On Point, and IA. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and two adult children. And Natalie, thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Barb. Um, I'm delighted to, to be speaking to this group. Uh, and um, I don't want to waste any more time because I, I do want to, um, I have a lot to cover and I, I'm not implying that we were wasting time actually, <laughs> but I want to plunge right in um, so that there'll be time for questions at the end if people have them. So here goes, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Oops, let me back up a minute. Okay. So, um, you, it sounds like a number of you are familiar with the book, The Knowledge Gap. Um, and so, you know, this may be somewhat familiar, uh, some of what I'm going to say if you've read the book. But I thought I'd talk about how and why, or start by talking about how and why I came to write this book. And it really started about, well, probably seven years ago now. Um, I had been uh, involved in the education reform movement to, to a limited extent here in Washington, D.C., where I live. And I'd also been writing about education for a while as a journalist. That's what my background was in. Um, and when I, I started looking into this whole question of, you know, the, the, what we call the achievement gap and why we've made so little progress in narrowing basically that that gap in test scores and other education outcomes between kids at the upper and lower ends of the socioeconomic spectrum. What I started with was high school because I was told and what it looked like to me was that's where the real problem was. That's where the test scores were lowest and that gap was the widest and the kids were the most disengaged. And, and you know, a lot, wasn't just me, a lot of education reformers have asked, you know, like, why does everything seem to fall apart at high school? The gains that we make in the lower grades don't carry over to high school, and why is that? So that's what I set out to investigate. But what I found, what I stumbled upon, really, was that what I had been told was the bright spot in education, which is elementary school, was really where the problems that become so apparent in high school have many of their roots. So what am I talking about? Um, well, mostly I'm talking about reading, the way we approach reading instruction. And of course, there are two basic components to reading. There's decoding, sounding out words, and that should be taught as a set of foundational skills, phonemic awareness and phonics and fluency. And I probably don't need to tell this group that we have 
many problems in this country with the way we approach that side of reading, the decoding side and the foundational skills. But I'm not gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the other basic component of reading, which is of course comprehension. And you need both of these to be a good reader. You need to be able to sound out the words and you need to be able to understand what they mean. And I would argue that the problems with the way we approach reading comprehension are actually more widespread and better hidden than the problems with the way we approach decoding. So what is the standard approach to teaching reading comprehension? Well, it's essentially taught as a set of comprehension skills and strategies. And there are a whole bunch of these. This is just one list I came across on the internet, um, but there are things like identify the main idea and details, determine author's purpose, or on, under strategies, make inferences, ask questions. I'm not gonna go into the distinction between skills and strategies. Um, a lot of teachers use those two terms interchangeably anyway. But the theory is there will often be a skill or strategy of the week, and the teacher will demonstrate that model, how to find the main idea, let's say, on a a book or a text that's chosen, not really for it, what it's about, but for how well it seems to lend itself to modeling that particular skill. And then the other part of this approach is that the kids then uh, scatter essentially to practice the skill on books that have been determined to be at their individual reading level. So here's a commonly used chart of uh, in individual reading levels and grade levels, and of course, kids can be uh, tested and, and deter it's determined that their individual reading level is years below their grade level, and they'll practice the skill on books that match their individual reading level um, to be directed to a basket of books at you know, level J or whatever. So that's the theory. Uh, the, 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 the idea here is that if you practice your skills say practice finding the main idea to the point where you get really good at it. You will move up if you're below grade level, you'll move up to where you need to be. You'll be able to apply that skill to any text that's put in front of you, uh, whether it's maybe a passage on an end of the year reading test or a high school textbook down the road, you'll be able to find the main idea. So let's try that out. Um, I'm just going to show you a paragraph from a newspaper and I'm sure you're all expert readers so you should have no trouble finding the main idea. So here goes. Much depended on the two overnight batsmen but this duo perished either side of lunch. The latter a little unfortunate to be a judged leg before and with Andrew Simons too being shown the dreaded finger off an inside edge the inevitable beckoned bar the pyrotechnics of Michael Clark and the ninth wicket. So I, if you're like me, you don't have any idea what the main idea of this paragraph is. It's not that you can't read the words, you can decode this. It's not even that you don't understand what the individual words mean. You may know what a judged mean and leg and before, but you don't know what it means to be a judged leg before. So what I neglected to tell you about this paragraph was that it was taken from a British newspaper and it is describing a cricket match. And if you're a cricket fan, you have no trouble following this. But if, if you're not a cricket fan, you don't know what this is trying to tell you. So this is something that cognitive scientists have known about for quite a while now. Um, back in the late 1980s, there was this study, which some of you may have heard about, especially if you've read my book, that's come to be known as the baseball study. And these two young researchers set out to figure out what is more important in reading comprehension. Is it general reading comprehension skill or ability? much you know about the topic you're reading about. And they chose the topic of baseball because they figured there are a lot of kids out there who are not generally good readers, but they do know a lot about baseball. And uh, these were seventh and eighth graders. So they took these kids, divided them into four groups, depending on how well they had done on a standardized reading comprehension test and how much they knew about baseball. And then they gave them a passage to read describing a baseball game and tested their comprehension of that passage. And what they found was what really made a difference was how much they knew about baseball, not how well they had done on that standardized reading test. So if you look at those two middle bars in that graph, the green one on the left, those are the supposedly poor readers who knew a lot about baseball. And to the right, those are the supposedly good readers who didn't know much about baseball. And as you can see, the poor readers significantly outperformed the good readers, quote unquote, good readers. So 
what this tells us is a couple of things. One is comprehension skills aren't skills like riding a bike. They don't just get better with practice. It's gonna depend on the topic and how much you know about it. And secondly, there's really no such thing as a fixed reading level. Again, it's gonna depend on the topic and how much the reader knows about it. So those, those are things to bear in mind. So that may be pretty obvious with a specialized subject like baseball or cricket or you know molecular biology. Uh, if you don't know much about the topic, it's gonna be hard to read about it. I think what's less obvious is how much we draw on our background knowledge of the world to make sense of almost anything we read. Um, so I'm gonna show you another paragraph from a newspaper, not about cricket this time, but um, this time I'd like you to think about what background knowledge you're drawing on to make sense of it. So this one's, it's a little dated now, it's from a couple of years ago, but um, two appeals by the president in his private capacity and represented by private lawyers have reached the Supreme Court in the past week. One, Trump v. Vance, is a formal appeal from a ruling by the Federal Appeals Court in New York upholding the validity of a grand jury subpoena obtained by the Manhattan District Attorney, Cyrus Vance, and served on the president's accountants for his personal and business tax records. Now, what I notice about this paragraph is it assumes a lot of knowledge about the American legal system. Um, you know, you kind of need to know, not in detail, but you, you have to have some idea of like what, what an appeal is, what the Supreme Court is, what is a federal appeals court, what's a grand jury, what's a subpoena, what's a district attorney. Uh, and this is not written for lawyers. This is written for the general public. Um, it's assumed that they're, they'll have that knowledge. If you do have that knowledge, no problem reading this probably, but if you don't, again, it's gonna be pretty hard to follow. So why is this? Why does prior knowledge help with reading comprehension and actually other things as well? It helps with um, being able to analyze what you're reading. It has to do with what cognitive scientists call working memory, um, which is, not really a place in the brain, but it's an aspect of consciousness where we are taking in new information and trying to make sense of it. And the important thing to know about working memory is that it can only hold a very limited number of items, maybe five or seven, for a limited period of time, maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds. Estimates vary, but not very, not very many things and not for a very long period of time. And so it can easily get overwhelmed. So, if you're reading something and it describes a double play and you don't know what that is, that's something you have to juggle in working memory. Um, if you already know what a double play is, if you've got it stored in long-term memory, then you can just withdraw that information from long-term memory. You don't have to juggle it. So the key is to have a lot of information, either about the topic or just generally in long-term memory. The more information you have stored in long-term memory, that you can retrieve when you need it, the more capacity you have in working memory for things like comprehension. So that's the basic idea. And to, to show that in a more graphic representation, um, this is a sort of diagram of memory. So that box on the left, sensory memory, um, we don't have to pay too much attention to that. It, the idea there is if you don't pay attention to something, you will forget it, okay? But then there's working memory, and you can see that uh, 20 seconds is about the limit of holding things there or it'll get forgotten. And the key here then is to getting things into long-term memory, which is potentially infinite, is first of all, transferring the in information to long-term memory, and then you have to be able to get it out again. That's the retrieval part. Basically the way to transfer things to long-term memory is to attach some meaning to them and think about them in a way that, that process it in a way that gives it meaning. And you could do that by explaining it to somebody else, talking about it or writing about it. And then to retrieve it, you need to practice um, recalling it. So through quizzes, for example, or again, through talking about it, writing about it, that's gonna make it easier to retrieve. So those are the basic, uh, I did the, that's, those are the basic principles of working memory, long-term memory here. So what does all this have to do with testing? Um, well, passages on reading tests, like any writing, uh, make certain assumptions about what the reader is going to know. 
writers don't explain every term they use because if they did, nobody would want to read what they'd written. So there are always assumptions about what the reader knows. And of course, passages on standardized reading tests are not tied to any particular body of knowledge. Uh, they're, they're not supposed to be. Um, they try to avoid topics that might be part of the curriculum because the idea is we're not testing kids' knowledge, we're testing their general reading comprehension skill or ability. But of course, if you don't have enough background information to understand the passage on the test, you never get a chance to demonstrate your skill at finding the main idea or whatever. So to illustrate what this like, looks like in reality, uh, just we'll show you a passage taken from, this is from a released item on a third grade standardized reading comprehension test. In one of the most remote places in the world, the Canadian Arctic, a people have survived over a thousand years. They are the Inuit. For the Inuit, the Arctic is a place teeming with life. Depending on how far north they live, the Inuit find everything from caribou herds and polar bears to beluga whales. Now, to us as educated adults, that seems pretty straightforward, but here's the same passage without the words and phrases that many third graders probably don't know. And if you're missing that much information, this paragraph becomes just as opaque as that paragraph about cricket was if you don't know much about cricket. Now, obviously some third graders will know these words and phrases or many of them, and they tend to be third graders who've been able to pick up that information at home um, because they have more highly educated families. The other third graders uh, depend on school for that kind of information. And unfortunately, in our current system, they're really the least likely to get it there. So why is that? Well, um, the elementary curriculum has always been dominated by reading and math, but over the last 20 years, as reading and math tests have become so important, these other subjects, uh, social studies, the arts, and to some extent science, have been marginalized or even eliminated from the curriculum. And that's especially true in schools where test scores are low, because the theory is, well, if the reading scores are low, we need to spend more time on reading. And often that means those reading comprehension skills and strategies. But the irony here is, or the, the, the tragedy is that those subjects that have been eliminated, social studies and science and the arts, are the subjects that are most likely to build the kind of academic knowledge and vocabulary that would actually help kids do well on reading comprehension tests and in school and in life. So in our effort to raise test scores, we've really been to a large extent shooting ourselves in the foot here. Now, this approach to teaching reading, I would say, has a negative effect on all kids. Um, it, this, this, a combination of skills and strategies and leveled reading. Um, but there are certain groups that struggle the most or that, that are impacted the most by this. And one, of course, is kids who struggle with decoding. In our leveled reading system, they're going to be limited to those simpler texts. And you know, just because they're struggling with decoding doesn't mean they couldn't also handle more sophisticated information. So it's gonna be pretty boring for them and it's gonna, they're not gonna have access to that information that could not only be interesting, but could also help them actually move up that ladder of text complexity. And then there are kids who may be fine with decoding, but they have less academic knowledge and vocabulary and they too are gonna to be relegated to those simpler texts and not given the opportunity to acquire the kind of knowledge and vocabulary that could help them do better in reading and in school. And then, of course, there are many kids who fall into both categories. But, you know, even kids who do fine with decoding and have plenty of academic knowledge and vocabulary often find the skills and strategies approach pretty boring and um, sometimes have behavior problems as a result. It's just not that interesting to practice finding the main idea day after day on a random variety of texts. So what does all this have to do with high school? Why was it that I thought, and many others think, that the real problem is high school and why do these, uh, the, the, these problems become so apparent there? Well, it has to do with the fact that having prior academic knowledge doesn't just help with comprehension. It also helps with absorbing and retaining new information. It's been said that knowledge is like Velcro. It sticks best 
to other related knowledge. And so if you start out, if you're a kid who starts out with a lot of the other half of the Velcro, academic knowledge and vocabulary, not only are you able to read more sophisticated texts, you're also able to absorb and retain new information from and vocabulary from those texts. You have that Velcro to, that it can stick to. And that in turn enables you to read yet more sophisticated texts. And then you can acquire even more sophisticated knowledge and vocabulary. And so that can be a kind of virtuous cycle if you start out with more of that Velcro on the, the other side. But if you start out with less of it, not only are you relegated to simpler texts, you're less likely to be able to absorb and retain the kind of information that will enable you to read more, yet more sophisticated texts. So what you get is something that has been called the Matthew effect in reading. And that's a reference to the gospel of St. Matthew and specifically the part that essentially says the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And what happens is if you don't address these gaps, every year that goes by, that gap gets larger, that gap between quote unquote good readers and poor readers. So by the time kids get to high school, that gap between the two groups can be quite wide and very difficult to narrow. But there's also, an, there's also another problem here, which is that it can look like skills and strategies is working at lower grade levels. But the approach can backfire when students reach upper grades. And that's because at lower grade levels, the texts that kids are being asked to read generally don't assume that much background knowledge, that academic background knowledge and vocabulary. So it can look like kids are getting better at finding the main idea, et cetera. But then when they get to upper grade levels and the texts do start assuming knowledge that kids don't have, they'll often hit a wall. There's also another gap that becomes apparent at the high school level, which is the difference between what we assume high school students know and what many do actually know. So especially in schools where test scores are low or with kids who are uh, maybe in higher performing schools, but they themselves are lower performing, they may not get exposed systematically to history, geography, science uh, through middle school. The kids who are behind in reading may be taken out of social studies, even if it's offered, or taken out of science to work on their reading. So they're being deprived of that opportunity to build their academic knowledge. But the result is that kids can get to high school uh, with huge gaps in their background knowledge in those areas. And they may not know things like the difference between a city and a state or a country and a continent. They may not have a good grasp of historical chronology because they've really never been exposed to it. And yet they're expected to read and understand textbooks like this. And if you don't have that background knowledge, then trying to read and understand a book like this is going to be very frustrating, both for you as a student and also for your teacher. Um, so that's one reason, two reasons really, high school seems to be such a problem. And when I stumbled, as I said, stumbled across this issue of the lack of content in the elementary curriculum, I was amazed because I thought I knew a lot about education. I'd been writing about it as a journalist. I'd been reading everything I could get my hands on. And I'd never heard that this was a problem. In fact, I did not even realize elementary schools were not trying to build kids' knowledge. I just, I'd been in lots of elementary school classrooms, but I realized I hadn't understood what I was looking at. Um, and there, there were people I discovered who were quite concerned about this issue and had been for a while, but I also realized that they were basically just talking to each other. And I thought what was needed was a book that would take a more journalistic narrative approach to this pretty complicated issue and uh, maybe help get it into the public conversation about education. That's the book that I tried to write, The Knowledge Gap. And as concerned as I was about this when I was researching and writing the book, I'm even more concerned now because we've had this period of remote and hybrid learning and that has made the situation more urgent than ever. We know the roots of this knowledge gap lie in kids' experiences outside of school and kids have been home in many places 24 seven for quite a long time now. And some of those kids have been effortlessly acquiring academic knowledge and vocabulary and others have clearly not been. So we really can't um, afford to lose any more time in addressing this problem. So I didn't 
write the book just to describe the problem. I also wanted to talk about where can we go from here. Um, and the good news is that there is a lot that we can do to narrow this knowledge gap uh, for all uh, and make education, frankly, a lot more interesting for all kids. So let's start with what can parents do to narrow the knowledge gap? Well, there are a number of things. Um, one is to read aloud from books kids can't yet read easily themselves. Uh, that's really important for reasons I'll go into in a minute. Um, and it's not just reading aloud. I mean, we do, do hear a lot about the importance of reading aloud, but it's also really important to have interactive dialogues about the content. So, you know, pause and say, what do you think, you know, what do you think about that? Or, you know, it doesn't have to be sophisticated, but just to get kids talking about the content and using the vocabulary in the books if possible. Um, and it, it's also important to read a series of books on the same topic. Uh, it's, it's important for kids to hear the same concepts, the same vocabulary, repeatedly in different contexts to get that information a chance to, to lodge in their long-term memories. So, um, and that interactive dialogue is another way that's a kind of, uh, that's a way of transferring the information into long-term memory. So if your child is interested in a particular topic, getting a series of books out of, from the library on that topic is a great idea. And then aside from reading and talking about books, just engaging in back and forth conversations about the world using sophisticated vocabulary um, can be hugely important in developing the kind of academic knowledge and vocabulary that are, will help kids become great, good readers and good students. And then, of course, you know, it's not really supposed to be parents' job primarily to educate their kids. It's supposed to be the school's job. So investigate the school curriculum and push for change if it's lacking, especially at the elementary level. Is, you know, it can be hard to get this information. It shouldn't be. And, and parents are certainly entitled to know on what, is the, what does the curriculum look like, especially with respect to English language arts or reading. Are schools focusing primarily on skills and strategies? And I would bet many are because that is the standard approach. So that's what parents can do. Um, but as I said, it really is the school's job to, to do this sort of thing. So what can individual teachers do to narrow the knowledge gap? Well, again, there are a lot of things and there's some overlap here with what parents can do. Um, one is to organize read alouds by topic, not skill and to spend a couple of weeks on a topic like sea mammals or whatever and ask questions that put content in the foreground uh, rather than saying okay let's we're going to now practice making an inference ask a question about the content of the book that requires students to make an inference about it that's going to be more effective and i'll show an example of that sort of thing in a minute and then organize classroom libraries by topic rather than by reading level. There's obviously a play, there's a time for students to read books that are easy for them to read, to exercise free choice, uh, but it shouldn't be the center of the curriculum. Um, there should be uh, topics, like not exactly like the ones you might be able to see in this picture. There are some baskets in addition to the baskets that have reading levels attached to them. There's some that say animals and plants and some that even just say nonfiction. Those are too broad, those categories. Uh, just because you've learned about sea mammals doesn't mean you're gonna have the background knowledge to understand a book about ponies. So if you've read about sea mammals for a couple of weeks, have a basket of books at various levels about sea mammals. And once kids have that background knowledge about the topic, you may be surprised at what level they can read at. Remember the baseball study. And. It, Again, be skeptical about reading levels in that way. Don't, you know, don't say to kids, though, no, don't even try reading that book because it's gonna just frustrate you. Maybe they know something about the topic and maybe it won't be frustrating to them. Maybe they'll be able to, to read it and understand it. And then spend lots of time on meaty social studies and science topics. As I said before, those are the kinds of topics, subjects that have the most potential to build kids' knowledge of the world, their academic knowledge and vocabulary. So those are things that individual teachers can do, but there's a limit to what any individual teacher 
or really a parent to some extent can do because knowledge building is a gradual cumulative process that's going to extend across years and what's really needed is a curriculum that does that and no individual teacher has control over what happens the year before the year after or in the classroom down the hall and so administrators and policymakers also need to step in here uh, and what they can do is adopt a content focused literacy curriculum that goes deeply into topics in social studies, science, and the arts. And ideally this should be in addition to social, actual time set aside for social studies and science, but it's very hard, and the arts, but it's very hard these days to get schools to set aside that time. It might be in the schedule, but often it gets sacrificed to reading and math. And so the sort of end run about around that is adopting a, a literacy curriculum that would be used during the literacy block that would cover these topics and spend at least two or three weeks on a particular topic. And there are now several such curricula out there, maybe six or eight, and they all cover different bodies of knowledge in different ways. Uh, so different schools or districts can choose the one that works best for their particular students and teachers. But they all have a couple of characteristics in common. One is, as I mentioned, they spend two or three weeks on a topic. They're organized by topic rather than by skill. And they also have teachers reading aloud to students from texts that they themselves could probably not read. Um, and that's hugely important um, because literacy is really about more than just teaching students to read and having them read them on their own. That's really just a small piece of the literacy puzzle. And we have focused far too much on reading um, when we talk about literacy. Literacy is also about listening, uh, listening to texts, as I mentioned, that are more sophisticated than what kids could read themselves. That's really gonna be important both for building their knowledge, their academic knowledge, and also for familiarizing themselves, familiarizing them, sorry, with the particular syntax and vocabulary of written language, which is almost always more complex than spoken language. So it's been found that kids' listening comprehension exceeds their reading comprehension on average through about age 13, not just when they're first learning to decode, but you know, it's, it's, so it takes a while for individual reading comprehension to catch up to listening comprehension. So kids can take in more sophisticated things through listening than through reading. But listening alone is not going to necessarily be enough to get that information embedded in long-term memory. What's also important is oral language, class discussion, talking about it, talking about the content that you, you've listened to and using that vocabulary in discussion. Those, those things are crucial. So one of the things that I did while I was researching the book was I followed a couple of early elementary classrooms through a school year. Uh, one focused on the skills-focused approach to comprehension and the other using one of these recently developed literacy curricula that focus on content, that focus on building knowledge. And I wish I could show you videos of these two classrooms because they were like night and day. Now they weren't identical classrooms, um, one was first grade, one was second grade, no two classrooms are identical, but they were pretty similar. All of the kids in these classrooms were from low-income families, all of them were children of color, and the teachers in both of these classrooms were hardworking, dedicated, talented teachers. But as I said, the classrooms were like on different planets. Um, and the main reason for that was what was being taught, was the curriculum. So I can't show you video, but I do have posters. And this is a poster from the skills-focused classroom. Uh, all of the posters were focused on comprehension skills, like main idea and supporting details. And it was very hard for the teacher to get a class discussion going, uh, because these were first graders. They really didn't, ha didn't have that much to say about sequence of events or whatever. Uh, they wanted to talk about you know, what was going on in the books, but that wasn't supposed to be the the focus of instruction. The other classroom was full of posters like this, which just brimming over with information and content. This one happens to be from a unit on Greek myths, and it's about the myth of Daedalus and Icarus. And the kids in this classroom had amazing discussions. These were second graders, but they, they had 
really thoughtful discussions about things like was Alexander the Great's ambitious nature an inspiration to his followers or a flaw? Um, kids are capable of much more than we think they're capable of. And these kids were thoroughly engaged, not, you know, 24 seven, but far more engaged than the kids in the other classroom. But a couple of things that I wanna point out about this poster, one is the vocabulary here, desperately plummeted, foresight. Now those are pretty sophisticated words for any group of second graders, but these second graders, most of them came from non-English speaking families, and some of them were still learning English themselves, and yet they were using sophisticated words like these in their conversation. I heard them doing it, and they, they were, using them in class discussion, those words would be stored in their long-term memories to serve them well in years to come. The other thing about this poster that I'd like to point out is it could look like this teacher is teaching comprehension skills. It says predict, what is Daedalus's plan? And in the, these boxes that say cause and effect, but she wasn't trying to teach the skill of making predictions or the skill of determining cause and effect. She was bringing those things in to help kids think deeply about the content they were learning. And that's what works. Uh, if you put the content in the foreground and ask questions that require kids to do that kind of thinking, they get into habits of critical and analytical thinking like that. It's the only, only way to develop those. I'd prefer to call them habits rather than skills. So, Another aspect of literacy that I haven't mentioned, but is, which is really crucial and too often neglected, is writing. So writing is potentially hugely powerful for developing literacy. Here are some of the things that writing can do. It can familiarize students with those conventions of written language that don't appear in spoken language, boosting their reading comprehension. If you learn how to use a subordinate conjunction or whatever, you're gonna be much better able to understand it when you encounter it in your reading. It can help develop analytical abilities. You've got to, when you write, you have to be connecting, you know, the main idea with supporting details, for example, uh, in a very powerful way. It can build and deepen knowledge. Um, it's an amazingly powerful form of both uh, getting things into long-term memory and getting them out, retrieving them. Um, and it's so powerful in doing that, that it can even compensate for gaps, large gaps in background knowledge, even at the high school level. But unfortunately, with the standard approach to writing instruction, many students get none of these benefits. So what is the standard approach to writing instruction? Well, broadly speaking, uh, especially at the elementary level, it's been write about personal experience or more recently, write about a topic you know little about. So here are two paragraphs about insects. Now write an opinion essay on your favorite insect. Um, that's uh, not uncommon. Uh, it's, there's been a focus on having kids write at length, beginning in kindergarten. And there's been the idea that you don't really need to worry too much about grammar, spelling, etc., those conventions, uh, because kids will pick them up naturally. So what's the problem? Well, one is uh, you can't really write about things you don't know. So if you only know two paragraphs worth of information about insects, it's gonna be hard to write your own paragraph about insects. Uh, it may be difficult to read about things you don't have much background knowledge of, but it's really impossible to write about them. Uh, second, if you write about personal experience, which kids do know about, you're not building the kind of knowledge of, of academic content that's really gonna help you. And third, writing is hard. It's much harder than we have given it credit for being. And writing at length only makes it harder. So having inexperienced writers write at length is a pretty surefire recipe for overwhelming their working memory. And as uh, I'm sure many teachers have observed, many students don't just pick up grammar, spelling, et cetera. It be taught, but not in the abstract. It needs to be taught in the context of students' own writing. That's what will work. So um, how can we make writing easier so that it doesn't overwhelm working memory and also use it to build knowledge, to take advantage of that power it has? Well, there are two basic principles we need to observe. One is begin writing at the sentence level. Don't ask inexperienced writers to write essays because they will not have the cognitive capacity either 
to process what they're trying to write about, uh, nor will they ever learn to write well in many cases. Um, and second, embed writing activities in the content of the core curriculum, because that's the kind of knowledge we want to build. Um, and there's only one method of writing instruction I know of that it incorporates both of these principles, and that's the writing revolution, um, which is a method developed over many years by Judith Hockman, a veteran educator, and she developed it really working with children who'd been diagnosed with learning, diagnosed with uh, language-based learning disabilities, but it works with all kids. And um, I'm the co-author of this book. Uh, it's really her ideas, but I, I helped bring them to fruition, I suppose, in some ways. So just to give you a quick example of one of the sentence level activities that's part of the method, it's called because, but, and so. And by the way, this method does not stop at the sentence level. It goes all the way through argumentative essays, but it, it does begin at the sentence level. So, and again, th this method, if I didn't mention, is designed to be used not just in the literacy block or ELA, it's designed to be used across the curriculum and at any grade level. So let's say you're teaching social studies or history and you're teaching about the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. You can give your students a sentence stem that they, about Lincoln that they would need to complete in three different ways with uh, each of these conjunctions. So the sentence stem might look like this. Abraham Lincoln was a great president because, but, and so. And each of these sentences require students to retrieve from long-term memory some information they've slightly forgotten and then put it in their own words. Very powerful. And it's different kinds of information, but is going to be more difficult than because, because it's asking, asking for contrasting information. So this is a really a way of teaching kids how to use conjunctions, which they don't all just pick up naturally, and also building their knowledge and analytical abilities at the same time. So there's different ways that kids could complete these sentence stems, but here's some examples. Because he kept the, the North united during the Civil War, but many Americans didn't like him while he was alive. So more books have been written about him than any other American leader. So in order to do this, to use this writing method to build knowledge, you obviously need a curriculum that provides kids with enough knowledge about any one topic that would enable them to complete these sentence stems. And the problem that we have at the elementary level is that because the curriculum, the skills-focused comprehension curriculum, skips around from one topic to the next so much, kids often don't acquire enough information about any one topic to be able to write these kinds of things. So the, you've got to start with curriculum. The curriculum has to have content. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that that's all schools need to do is adopt a content-focused knowledge-building curriculum. It's the first step, but it's only the first step. Because teachers, most teachers, are going to find this approach very different from what they're used to and different from what they've been trained to do as, as part of their education. So they're going to be, in many cases, some obstacles to getting the curriculum implemented well and implemented in the way that will make it effective. And one big obstacle here is testing, because as I mentioned, standardized reading comprehension tests, which are still very important and you know the way schools and often teachers are evaluated, they are not tied to any particular body of knowledge. Um, and so it can be discouraging because your kids may know a lot about you know, Greek myths or the human digestive system, but they get to the testing room and the passages are about the Inuit or Amelia Earhart or whatever, and they don't yet have the critical mass of academic knowledge and vocabulary that will enable them to read and understand almost anything that's thrown at them. Uh, someday that will happen, but we can't really predict in any individual case when that will be. And it can also discourage teachers from focusing on the content in a curriculum that they're supposed to be implementing. If they figure, well, this information is not going to be on the test and what my kids will need is their, their skills because that's what the tests appear to be testing. So this, this is something that needs to be overcome. Teachers um, need to understand what those tests are really testing and that to a large extent, they are tests of general knowledge and vocabulary. But there are other obstacles as well. Uh, and just briefly, um, 
some of the possible obstacles. Some are going to be intellectual, uh, and that it boils down to the fact that this is so unfamiliar for many teachers. They may not have ever heard about the baseball study. They may not have ever heard that it's important uh, to build kids' knowledge if you want them to become good reading comprehenders. In fact, they may have been told it's really not important and kids will just be bored if you try to tell them about factual information, which actually is not true if it's done in an engaging way. So that's one set of obstacles. And then there are emotional obstacles, um, which largely boil down to maybe you could say guilt, because if you've spent years teaching in a certain way in the sincere belief that you're helping kids and somebody comes along and tells you, actually, you've been holding them back, um, that's a very difficult message to hear. And it's, it's human nature to just uh, raise defenses against hearing that. And then lastly, even if you want to change what you're doing, um, there are problems of behavior, of habit. Teaching is a really complex activity, and it can be just hard in the moment to remember to do things differently. So none of these obstacles are insurmountable. Um, they will probably, though, take time, patience, and support, and some kind of uh, professional development or coaching um, that will enable teachers to deliver these curricula effectively. But I just want to leave you, before we uh, get to questions, if you have them, um, you know, sometimes people think that this approach, and, and I guess it's partly because of the term knowledge gap, that this approach to building knowledge is really only important for kids who are not acquiring a lot of not academic knowledge at home, kids from less educated families, and it's, it's going to be boring for the other kids. And that's really not true. Um, I've talked to a lot of teachers who have had mixed classrooms. You know, some of the kids come in with a lot of background knowledge and some of them come in with very little. And what they tell me is that this approach works for all kids, that high achievers thrive and so do lower achievers. And so I'd just like to end with one, um, focusing on one teacher in particular who um, I profiled for an article in The Atlantic. Her name is Dolores Fowler, and she teaches at an elementary school in Cookville, Tennessee. And she'd been teaching for 25 or 30 years, and the school district had decided it wanted to adopt uh, one of these new knowledge building curricula, and they asked her to be part of the pilot. Uh, this, was a, this was a curriculum called Core Knowledge Language Arts, which I talk a lot about in the book, because that was also the curriculum being used by that second grade classroom I followed. And Dolores had seen a lot of education fads come and go, and she was pretty skeptical. Um, she took a look at this curriculum and she thought, you know, my third graders are not going to be interested in ancient Rome or the Vikings, and they won't be able to handle that. It's really, you know, history is not developmentally appropriate for third graders. A lot of teachers believe that. And she also thought it looked pretty scripted, um, but she, she gave it a try. And she became a total convert. And what convinced her were basically two things, although there were some other things as well, which I'll get to, but the main things were student engagement. The kids, not only were they able to understand about ancient Rome and the Vikings, they couldn't get enough of it. They didn't want her to stop reading and they wanted more books on those topics. She'd rarely seen them so engaged. And the other thing that convinced her was their, their writing. Um, they'd been reluctant writers at this school, even though it was largely a higher income demographic, these kids just didn't want to write. But once they had something to write about, there was no stopping them. So she found that really powerful. But then again, another consideration here was equity. Although most of these kids came from higher income families, there were some who did not and um, who were almost inevitably in the lower reading groups. And Dolores used to worry about how they were ever going to be able to move up. And she saw those kids blossom as well and become full-fledged members of the classroom community. So there was one little girl named Abby who was from a lower income, less educated family, had been diagnosed with a learning disability, and she just blossomed. She was able to contribute to class discussion. Um, and she also incidentally, went from the 10th percentile in reading comprehension at the beginning of the year to just below average by mid-December. And I suspect that had a lot to do with building her confidence. Um, and at the end of the year, uh, she told Dolores, um, I'm not going to stop reading, I promise you. 
So I will stop there and um, be happy to, to take any questions people might have. Um, Natalie, in the chat, we did have a question asking for um, some of the curricula, the name of some of the curricula that focus on content. Um, and then someone suggested um, going to Curricula Matters. So if you can give us some more. Yes. Uh, so Curricula Matters is, is a one play. That's a group of administrators, um, like chief academic officers from districts that have adopted some of these different curricula. So you'll find some information there. I wish I had a really good resource to send people to. Um, I can tell you the names of some of them. So Core Knowledge Language Arts is the oldest of them and the one I'm most familiar with. And it's the one that probably has the most historical content um, and the most content period. Uh, it spends like two, maybe three weeks on a topic and, and, and packs a lot of information in. And then there's um, at the other end of the spectrum, sort of there's, there's EL education, which uh, is more, um, they spend maybe a couple of months on a topic and there's a lot of, uh, it incorporates more project-based learning. And then there are others like Wit and Wisdom, which uh, has um, works of art as part of the curriculum. Um, so you could go to a couple of sites in addition to Curriculum Matters, which I do recommend. There's also the Knowledge Matters website, which has, a school tour um, where they, they visited different schools around the country that are using these various curricula, including the one where uh, Dol Dolores Fowler teaches. And then there's edreports.org, which, uh, which rates ELA and math curricula for, on various criteria. And one in the ELA category is knowledge building. Um, I, would, I would be a little cautious about some of their ratings. And then the Louisiana Department of Education also has its own uh, rating system that's open to the public that uh, has rated these various curricula. And there's a couple more. There's one called Bookworms. There's one called Match Fish Tank that's pretty new. Uh, there's one called Arc Core. So um, I'm, I don't, you know, I don't recommend any specific curriculum because I'm not a curriculum expert, really. Uh, but those are just, those are some of the names that are out there. Um, should I call on people, Christy, or do you want to? I see people with some hands raised. You can call on them as you see them, Natalie. Okay, I see uh, Janelle had a hand up and then Katie. So thank you so much, Natalie. This was really, really wonderful and informative. Um, the, one of the things that I've been thinking about, and, and actually I'm in, I'm in private practice, used to be uh, in a classroom, and somebody had written in the chat about how 25 years ago we did everything thematically, everything was totally connected, and I agree. There was like deep dives that we were going into in terms of content and ideation and just, just rich vocabulary that I think led to a lot more. What I found so interesting and this is over the course of probably 10 years, and I would love to know your opinion on this, um, is that we are now in a culture of, of being able to have so much information at our fingertips that er nothing is integrated anymore, that it's just sort of facts of, you know, just, just, just you know, we, if, if we are thinking about something, we don't pause, we don't ingest it, we don't wait to let it go more deeply. Instead, you know, we'll get on our phones or we'll get on the internet and find that information. And so what I sort of see is that we don't have that level of curiosity as much anymore with students, especially as they get into that high school level. So I love, love, love how we're talking about it at the elementary level and how we need to start there. So the question is, do you see the impact of just technology and, and what's happened over the course of the last 20 years, let's say, as being a piece of this as well? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I have heard from more than one educator that there be, who, who have been around for a while, that they're seeing kids, even from high, highly educated families, coming into school with less sophisticated knowledge and vocabulary. And the speculation is that the parents are on their phones, that there's not as much of that dialogue uh, between adults and children that 
is really essential to building that kind of vocabulary. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I don't really have hard evidence about that, but I think it's probably a factor. And I think another factor, although again, this isn't totally new, is you, you, know, you often hear educators say, well, we don't really need to teach kids facts because they can just Google things, um, which is a tremendous fallacy. It imposes a burden on working memory to Google something. Um, and you may not understand, as I've discovered when I tried to Google the terms in that cricket paragraph, you may not understand the definitions you get. And um, so, I, I, but that isn't totally new. I've also read that, you know, 100 years ago, they would say, you don't need to teach facts because people, kids can just look things up in the encyclopedia. So, <laughs> and so it has become easier to do that. Um, but I do think that that slower pace that you were talking about, that's, it, it, it doesn't slow the higher achieving kids down, but I think it is also what enables some of the other kids, the kids who are not necessarily as quick, but have really interesting things to contribute. It enables them to, that they get that grist that they need for their intellectual mill. They get the information that they need to process and come up with some, you know, teachers have told me that it's the kids with the IEPs, it's the English language learners, et cetera, the kids in the low groups who often come up with the most interesting insights in class discussion when you adopt this slower pace and go more deeply into particular topics. So I think it's hugely important in unlocking the potential of so many kids. So, um, sure. And I know Katie, you had a, a question. No, uh, thank you so much for being here, Natalie. This has been awesome. Um, I just, a couple of things. One, I, with, with COVID, we've been homeschooling our three kids um, and, and it's, I'm not in education, so I didn't know that kids, you know, that maybe history was developmentally above kids. And so we've been exposing our kids to like a literature-based history curriculum and we've been studying the digestive tract and we spent like three months on Black History after Black History Month because the kids were so absorbed in it. It's been amazing what they've been able to pull pull together and, and articulate and they're, they're they're just fascinated by these topics so um so i've had personal experience with with what you've written the kids love love this information at least my three do um but i guess my other question is um is these um these like content rich curriculum um are all of them it, i mean if reading comprehension is the combination of decoding and language comprehension do all of these curriculums also provide um, strong, um, like science-based reading instruction, like as far as decoding and? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, not all of them have that component. Um, some, some of them don't. I know core knowledge language arts does have what I'm told, and I am not an expert on the decoding side, but um, Cornell's Language Arts has, has a, a strong decoding skills strand, it's called, um, and some of the, I think EL Education does as well. Some of them have chosen to go a different route, like wit and wisdom, rather than uh, having their own component for on decoding, they've uh, teamed up with Wilson Reading, and they have actually what's really, the, the, that partnership has led to a series of decodable readers that are actually connected to the content in the read-alouds in the curriculum, and I'm told that those are hugely popular. So they, they do it in different ways, um, and obviously, you know, either, whether it's part of the curriculum itself or whether it's an add-on, you do you need a strong uh, decoding component to, to make it a complete curriculum. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, I don't know if there's there are other questions in the chat or uh, whether we have time for, for any more. Um, Why don't we take one more and then we'll um, go ahead, Mira. Sure, I, I put this in the chat. I didn't know how we were going to do it. But um, so, yes, thank you, uh, Natalie. It's been great. Are you familiar with the work of Nell Duke at the University of Michigan, who's done a lot of curricula research and so forth, and um, to, I guess, support your findings? Um, she's done studies that, that show, in fact, that when you incorporate um, literacy learning in social studies or sciences, there is actually a boost. There's a synergy. Reading scores go up. 
Um, and even if you're, uh, she's talking a little bit higher grades, but you know, if you're without incorporating uh, Wilson necessarily, there is, uh, I think some teachers feel that if you're focused on, even if you're writing in social studies, that's not really helping you're gonna boost your reading scores, but it actually does and there is research to prove it. And she's got a great website with a lot of free materials of um, teaching literacy through content, so. Yeah, yeah, I am familiar with uh, at least some of her work. And, um, and I would add that there's, uh, there's another study that came out a few months ago, six months ago or so, um, where they just looked at how much time elementary students spent on social studies as compared to reading. And what then this was from grades one through five and looked at reading scores. And what they found was that a, an extra half hour I think it was a half hour a day of social studies led to, an, it, well, led to, I won't say, it was correlated with an increase in reading scores, but an extra half hour of reading or ELA was not. And the probable explanation there is that the kids were picking up, even with the fairly anemic social studies curricula that we find in elementary schools, they were still getting more knowledge from that that boosted their reading comprehension than they were from those skills and strategies activities. So uh, yes, I think we are getting more research indicating the importance of building kids' knowledge and connecting it to increases in reading scores, which, you know, for the reasons I mentioned, that's been hard to do because standardized tests are not tied to the knowledge that's being built. But there are now a couple of ongoing randomized control trials, uh, longitudinal studies, that are looking at this and the preliminary results from them are very, very encouraging. Natalie, what was that study that did the 30 minutes of social studies versus 30 minutes of reading? What was study was? Uh, it, so it was produced by uh, a think tank here in DC called the Fordham, the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. And I can't remember the name of the study, but I did okay. write a piece for Forbes about it. If you if you Google, you could you could Google Thomas B. Fordham social studies, you'll probably get it. If not, you could Google my name, Forbes and social studies, and you'll get what I wrote about it. Okay. So. Okay. Good. Well Natalie, thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about, a lot to apply, a talk a lot to talk to colleagues about and to other parents about and people we work with. Um, so thank you so much. As Natalie mentioned, um, we are going to have this on um, our website. Christy will send out to you the link for the, Christy, are you sending out the link or they just need to go to the website for if they want to catch it online? And I will listen? send it out to them once it's up online, ready to go. Okay. So that'll be out. Feel free to share it. Um, we'd love to get this out. As you know, coming today was free. So you know, we want you to, we want you to share this information. It's very valuable, as you know, from being here. So thank you, everyone. Natalie, thank you so much. And we hope thank everyone, you for having me. we have, hope you have a great Saturday.